Hi, everybody. It's Renell Delmont. Uh, thank you for your comments. I enjoy reading them. I don't answer all of them, but I do eventually get to read them. So don't think I'm ignoring any of you. I read the negative comments and the po mostly positive ones, thank goodness. So it gives me um, motivation to keep making these movies. I don't make enough of them. I have so many ideas for new videos. And I will do one, uh, a couple of them actually, because there are too many books on this subject and too many books on Charles Lindbergh to make one video showing you all the books and uh, briefly discussing them. I don't know how many videos that's going to take, but I'll, I'll get around to doing it. I'm trying to finish my own book to add to the accumulation of stacks every year people write about Lindbergh or the kidnapping. So I'm here today because it's April 3rd. I didn't want to pass this day up. I missed March 1st. I don't know what I would have done other than discuss Charlie and his short life. It's very sad, but also sad is the execution of a man. Whether you believe he was guilty or innocent, we should not have the death penalty in a country like ours. No, it should not exist. Even if uh, there are murderers who have no mercy on their victims. What it does is endanger the rest of us because there must have been people who have been executed who were innocent. There have been people on death row who've been proven innocent by the Innocence Project. Remember that? Uh, so many people are freed from 40 years 10 years of prison, whatever, and they're on death row, and then DNA has proven them to be innocent. So I'm sure there have been people executed who were innocent. And this is a crime. A, a civilized country or any country should not have, and no country has the death penalty. We're alone with Saudi Arabia. Yes. Okay. So why am I here today? It's April 3rd, 86 years after Richard Hauptman was strapped into a wooden chair. They have it at the Trenton Museum if you want to go and look at it, Old Smokey. Uh, so what I'm going to do is tell you, uh, I'm going to play the end of Mark Rydell's movie for you, because I know it's hard to find. Uh, I don't even know where I got a copy of it. It's called Crime of the Century, and Mark Rydell, the director, made it, I believe, for HBO. Uh, this is the book that it's based on. The book is called Crime of the Century, but they changed that name either because the book was published in America or for the film. I'm not sure why they changed the name. Originally, it was called The Airman and the Carpenter by Ludovic Kennedy. He's the Sir Ludovic. He was knighted by the Queen He's no longer alive, but he wrote this book in the 80s. This was the second one after Scapegoat by Anthony Scaduto in 76. So this must have been around 80, 1980. The date is not in the book. I have the paperback, but the hard cover says Airman and the Carpenter. So from, uh, yes, so Sir Ludovic Kennedy was a very important, uh, was a reporter, uh, an author of, well, 10 Rillington Place, I think is the movie. I, I have a copy of it. It's, he, he wrote, a, before he wrote Crime of the Century or The Airman and the Carpenter, Ludovic Kennedy was famous for writing a book about an, uh, a British crime. And I'm trying to, well, it doesn't matter. I, I have a copy of that movie and it's a riveting story. So evidently, Ludovic Kennedy was into true crime, and he was also into investigating whether people were actually guilty or innocent. This is a very good book. You should get a copy of it if you can. It's full of fascinating information, even if you don't agree with him. He believes Hauptmann was innocent, but he doesn't even think to accuse Lindbergh of anything, any wrongdoing. 
uh, it's not until 1993 that Algren and Monier break the ground in this case by pointing a finger at Charles Lindbergh, other than Noel Bain, and I'll talk about these books some other time, but Noel Bain's book came out around the same time as Algren and Monier's, in which they say, uh, A&M, they say that Lindbergh was pulling another prank, a joke on his wife, the baby died by accident, and he made up a kidnapping to cover himself. But even Algren and Monier thought that it's possible that Lindbergh had purposely killed his child, but they didn't want to go that far in the book. Gregory Algren told me this because I've asked him, did you ever think that Lindbergh might have done it on purpose? And they did think of that, but they didn't want to go that far in the book. So they kept it to the prank theory. But Noel Bain's book came out at the same time. It's called Lindbergh, the Crime. And I, I could talk about these books some other time, but you should know that Noel Bain, along with Algren and Monier, at the same time, he also accused Lindbergh, but not of killing his baby, of covering up his baby's death, his child's death at the hands of his sister-in-law, Elizabeth Morrow. So even Noel Bain, who was willing to accuse Lindbergh of wrongdoing, didn't go as far as Algren and Monier in 93, accusing Lindbergh of actually killing his son. So none of these people, not, neither Ludovic Kennedy or Anthony Scaduto or anybody else who's ever written a book previous to Algren and Monier never ever considered, or if they did, they kept their thoughts to themselves because nobody put it in a publication that Lindbergh might uh, have done away with his son. So it's not in here either. You're not going to find Lindbergh guilty of very much in this book other than lying at the, uh, at the trial of Richard Hauptman. So, you know, I forgot the name of the actor who plays Lindbergh in this movie that I'm going to show you. I'm not showing you the whole film, <laughs> just the end, last couple of minutes, because you need to see it. And I know it's a hard movie to get. I looked I looked all over uh, YouTube. I didn't see uh, any download of it. And I don't know if Amazon has it. So I'm going to show you a piece of it um, for the 86th anniversary of that execution. So what, a, what, what do I want to tell you about this film? I love, I, I love watching this film, even though it's, it's sad in many ways, but it's also for those of us who studied the case for so long to watch Norman Schwarzkopf and David Wilentz and Governor Hoffman being portrayed. Now there is another film, it's terrible. I, I don't remember what they called it. It came in the 70s, in the early 70s. And it's, I don't remember what they call it, but this one is called Crime of the Century, made for HBO. Stephen Rea oh, does a fantastic job playing Hauptman. I love Stephen Rea. He's been in a couple of movies that I like. And Isabella Rossellini plays Anna Hauptman. The man that the actor who plays David Wilentz, I also love. His name is David Paymer, P-A-Y-M-E-R. And my favorite, <clears throat> my favorite movie with him is The Quiz Show. Um, I used to teach classes and films based on books, so forgive me if I, I get too enthusiastic about certain films, but uh, yes, David Paymer plays David Wilentz. I don't remember the actor who plays uh, Schwarzkopf, I forgot his name, but it, the, the, the screen will scroll and you'll see his name there. But uh, my favorite is Michael Moriarty, who I knew in Greenwich Village, his son and my son. His son's name was Chris or Christopher. When they were four years old, my son and Christopher, <clears throat> they took uh, Suzuki violin lessons together. Ah, oh, it was so long ago. 
Yeah, well, so I'd love to know. I, I looked up Michael Moriarty. He plays Governor Hoffman, and it's a great, uh, great portrayal. He doesn't really look like Hoffman, but he's great in the part. And uh, he lives in Canada somewhere. I would love to find out if any of you know how to get in touch with Michael Moriarty. I'd love to know what he thought of the case because they all actually, Stephen Rea made a comment to the New York Times when this movie came out that he believed Hauptman shouldn't have been electrocuted, but that he was involved somehow. That's what most people say, that they're sympathetic to Hauptman's situation because they believe there were other people involved he was involved with bigger fish, fish. I shouldn't have said that word, should I? <laughs> okay, so uh, Isabella Rossellini plays Anna Hauptman. David Pamer plays with Lentz. I don't know the name of the guy with Schwarzkopf's role, but Michael Moriarty is Governor Hoffman. All the names of everybody are portrayed in this film. On a bodding, the lady, the secretary who goes, okay, all the names. Everybody in this book is in this movie. And I've watched it many times and I'm going to show you the ending of it, okay? If, if I can handle the share screen option here. Ah, there we go. Yeah, oh, one more thing. I don't know how many of you have ever seen The Crucible. Arthur Miller's play done, I think Nicholas Heitner was the director, but it's one of the greatest pieces of work of Daniel Day-Lewis. He plays John Proctor, who is going to hang. You know, the crucible is about the Salem witch trials and Proctor is going to hang. He was consorting with witches and um, he's given a chance at the end of that film to sign a confession that he was guilty with the witches. And if he signs the paper, he can live out his life with his wife and his children. And he's about to sign the paper. I don't want to give away the, I've watched that movie so many times, The Crucible with Daniel Day-Lewis, and he's about to sign the paper. And he says to his wife, I love you. I want to be with you, but I can't do this and he rips up the paper. He can't, he can't live without his name. His name, he, he will be confessing to something he did not do and he cannot live that way. And he rips up the paper and of course he hangs. It's a heart-wrenching ending. And the scene you're gonna see when I turn on the movie, uh, of course, Hauptman is in the cell and Anna, has come to him with the $75,000 offer. A newspaper, I don't remember which one it was, is going to give her and the baby $75,000 if Hauptman will, sign, will write a confession. And I can't play the whole movie. You should really find out where you can see this, get a copy of it for yourself, but you'll see them talking about, she's, she's just like John Proctor in The Crucible at the end of that, where Hauptman wants to make a confession because his wife will have $75,000, but he can't do it. He, he can't admit to something that he hasn't done. So let's share the screen. Share the screen, oh. I'm not good at this. Okay, now we have to share the sound. There they are. So she's just telling him. She's telling him about the $75,000. Man. Oh, 
Honey. I care about this young baby. I will do anything for you. Anything you tell me. Tell me what to do, honey. If nothing, maybe if I do what they want, one day they learn the truth, then maybe they let me go. Maybe it's not so bad to tell them some made up stories, so they let me stay with you. Maybe it's not so bad. Tell me that's what you want me to do, Annie, and I'll do it. Annie. <sighs> You must tell me. Don't you understand? I'm nothing. I'm gone. It broken me into little pieces. I give myself to you. Do what you want with me. No. No. You know what you want. I can see it. Why don't you tell me? Just a hint. No words. Just a look. Am I to live? I know you. Don't I know you well, my Annie? I must do this alone. I know. And if I make the wrong choice, you won't tell me. You'll go on laughing me because you're my dear wife. Stay silent then. No lies ever pass these lips, I know that. I want to live. Is that so wrong? <laughs> to go on loving you? <laughs> See your son grow up? <laughs> But I can't do what they ask. I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> it's what you wanted, isn't it? Truth should make you free, my love. Nothing? He's saying nothing? Nothing. I don't believe this guy. Well, he's protecting somebody. He has to be. But why would he die for him? Or maybe he figures he's dead anyway. I mean, contracts are taken out on guys in prison. It happens all the time. Or he's innocent. Harold, did you tell him that? No, I did not. Did he sense it from you? I doubt it. Of course he did. Colonel, why are you so certain about things you never saw and events you never witnessed? The governor of the state of New Jersey goes to his cell in person, offers him a deal. What do you expect him to think? He thinks Christmas has come early. He's not going to confess with the governor in his corner, is he? If Halpin ends up on that chair, it's going to be your hand on the switch. Sounds like you're getting a little jumpy, Colonel. I don't have a problem. You're the one with the problem here. No, I think all three of us are up to our neck in this. Your problem is that he may go to his death saying he's innocent, and that'll never go away. It'll haunt you and the memory of you and the whole damn state of New Jersey for a long, long time. He'll confess. When he gets strapped into that chair, he will talk. He will. He'll confess. We'll see, won't we? Early morning, April 3rd, 1936. Police are marched into position to handle the massive crowds expected to gather for the execution of Bruno Richard Hoffman sometime this evening.
I'm thinking about the day I first met you at Lena's. We listened to the radio. Then you walked me to the subway. Oh, from then till now and forever. This is for you. Richard, my darling. My sweet love. This evening. Eight o'clock. Fine. Thanks. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Lights sweep the crowds and the enormous press corps that have gathered at Trenton State Penitentiary for this evening's execution. The invited witnesses are searched as they enter the prison for this internationally awaited event. You are here for the sole purpose of witnessing this execution as required by law. You will remain in silence throughout. Anyone who speaks or cries out will be removed by the guards. If the prisoner speaks or indicates that he wishes to make a confession, I and I alone will give whatever response I deem necessary. Please button your coats. Bring help me. Das macht das ins Licht vor deinem Angesicht, wo ich nicht gehe. 
Well, I'm sorry to play something so sad, but it's really worthwhile to watch the movie. Nobody blames Lindbergh for anything in it except for his, well, they excuse his lies in the film. Anyway, I'll be back with more videos. Uh, what else did I want to tell you? I'm so moved by that. No matter how many times I see it, it, uh, reminds me of the ending of the crucible that's so powerful because John Proctor did not want to live with a lie. Uh, it's, he said, leave me my name, that's all I have. And he went to his death and so did Hauptmann. He, I'm not sure if the $75,000 was um, to, if he had accepted it, would his uh, sentence have been commuted? No. I don't think so. He still would have been electrocuted, but he wouldn't tell a lie. I know you, a lot of you don't believe me. <laughs> You're right. So keep on with the comments. I love reading them. Uh, did I tell you that this movie was made by Mark Rydell? I'm not sure that I mentioned that. R-Y-D-E-L-L. -L. It was made for HBO. 
the other movie a few years earlier than this, I don't remember what it's called, Don't Bother With It, it's awful. By the way, Lindbergh has no part in this movie. He's barely in it. Uh, the one that I'm talking about, Mark Rydell's version of this book, Airman and the Carpenter. Uh, Lindbergh, I don't even know the name of the actor, but uh, he's barely in it. So the previous movie has much more about a uh, portrayal of Lindbergh and Anne, but I don't remember why I hated it, but I just don't like it. But that's my opinion. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, and have a good day, and I'll be back. Thank you. Bye.